Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Trusted CI webinar for June 27th, 2022. I'm your host, Jeanette Dalpide. Trusted CI is the NSF Cybersecurity Center of Excellence, and these webinars are part of its mission to deliver high quality, actionable guidance regarding cybersecurity to the NSF community. More information about Trusted CI can be found at trustedci.org. Today's topic is ransomware threats and mitigations. Our presenters are Sarah Bigham and Kristen Stevens, both from RenISec. Sarah serves as lead security analyst and Kristen serves as the director of technical operations. Before we begin, there's a few things to note. First, the presentation is being recorded. Second, participants are welcome to ask questions in the chat, um, but our presenters have asked that we hold the questions until the end. So if you type a question, we'll get to it. Um, we're just waiting until the end. And with that, I'll hand things over to Sarah. Sarah, welcome. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Um, thank you for having us today. And um, thank you all for being here. I was a little excited to get started, if you couldn't tell. <laughs> Um, so today we're going to be talking about ransomware threats and mitigations. Um, really, we could speak all day about just one of these, um, but we're going to try to boil things down um, to one hour and cover just some of the highlights. So uh, before we dive in, I'd like to give you guys a bit of a background on RenISec. Excuse me. So one of the first things um, I get asked when I tell people that I work for RenISec is what in the heck is RenISec, right? So it essentially is um, research and education networks, information sharing and analysis center. Um, and as Kim Milford, our executive director says, our name is our mission. Um, and we do information sharing and analysis among other things. So we were established in uh, 2003 and we had just 13 member institutions. And we currently have around 700 member institutions with 3000 member reps. So we've grown quite a bit. Um, and we're getting ready to celebrate our 20th anniversary, which is really exciting. So um, we're part of NCI or the National Council of ISACs. Um, and they're just like us. They have um, different ISACs that are sector specific. Excuse me. Um, so all of the critical, se uh, critical sectors of the US economy are represented by um, an ISAC. We also have many subsectors or partial sectors as well. Um, some of the services we provide members are, um, we do a daily situational awareness report or the daily watch, which I'm sure some of you are familiar with, um, alerts and advisories, analysis reports of um, certain cybersecurity threats and mitigations, kind of like what we're doing here today. We offer peer assessments, uh, blended threat workshops, as well as um, a security event system or CES, which I'm sure, again, some of you are familiar with. Um, RENISAC also acts as the CCERT, which is the Computer um, Security Incident Response Team for r &E. um, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to Kristen to share some analysis of um, some of the work that we do as a CCERT. Oh, you're still muted. That always catches me. Um, so some ransomware stats, some of the things that when I, last year, we weren't, uh, Red Isaac wasn't officially tracking ransomware attacks on higher ed, um, but I started looking back to 2021, just doing some OSINT searches to see, you know, how many can I find? And one of the numbers that kept coming up was 26, 26 higher ed schools, uh, universities were attacked. And to kind of verify that number, I then went and looked for the 26 and was able to find that. So I'm going to stick with that number for 2021. Um, starting in 2022, we were actively now tracking. And um, year to date, we have 20 different incidents. Uh, one of the things, the, the two different graphs that I'm showing, I thought was kind of interesting. So at the EDUCAUSE CPPC conference, I presented this left-hand blue slide, um, which was kind of a breakdown of the ransomware groups that we were that we had information on at, at, for attacks on higher ed, where Black Cat was kind of taking the lead there. Um, if I ran kind of the same statistics over the weekend, and now we've got a lot of shifting around, which isn't surprising for ransomware if you think about it. Um, and it really isn't 
I mean, the numbers are up, um, obviously. Sorry, I'll apologize in advance. My, my little two-year-old germ vector gave me her cold over the weekend. So, um, so I, putting them side by side, I just thought it was kind of interesting to see how all these things start to shift. In uh, April of 2022, the FBI released a flash alert specifically on the black cat ALF V or ALF VM. I've seen it um, both ways. Uh, at the time within April, there are at least 60 entities that had been hit by this ransomware. And I'll go a little bit into this specifically because it's very interest. It's an interesting, um, it has an interesting attack vector. It has a lot of ramifications as far as being detected and how it's being incorporated by different affiliates and different uh, criminal groups. So a lot of the numbers, and hopefully um, if you're a Ren Isaac member, you've seen these before. Through our CSERT work, we collect numbers for the issues that can lead to ransomware. So compromised machines, compromised credentials, obviously being seen as, as the top two hits. These are the numbers for 2021 and 2020. And these are the numbers of notifications that were sent out from the CSERT. So these numbers don't represent uh, the number of compromised machines or the number of compromised credentials. These numbers rep could represent, one notification could represent one compromised machine, or it could represent two dozen compromised machines. So that should give you kind of a scope of what we send out. Um, so not surprising, spam and fish is up there. Open me will realize vulnerable machines and other miscellaneous notifications. Sometimes from third party providers, we get one-off notifications that are a little more specific to just saying you have a compromised machine or a compromised credential. So now I'm gonna turn it back over to Sarah to talk about how, what the, the, land, the third landscape looks like. Sure, thank you so much, Kristen. Um, so as you can see referenced here, CISA issued um, a report in February on ransomware called the Increased Globalized Threat of Ransomware. Um, and it has a bunch of high level information, but also details about what you can do um, with ransomware and things you need to consider. Um, so they saw tactics and techniques continue to evolve in 2021, and we've seen this throughout. Um, in years prior, the ransomware was really poorly written, kind of script kiddies, if you will. It was very haphazard, and there really wasn't any strategy to who they were targeting or hitting up for money. And it was a very low amount of money that they were requesting for ransom. Um, they then switched gears to a mainly consumer focus. So since then, they've been demonstrating growing technological and business sophistication. Um, and it's increased the ransomware threats to organizations globally. And you'll see what the third bullet here um, points out that they're shifting away from big game hunting in the US. Uh, that was the way it was for last two years, probably. Predominantly large uh, organizations in the US were hit with ransomware attacks. That's where the big money was. So now we're seeing some shifting in that with this latest CISA report, uh, where it's starting to become more globalized. So um, we're also seeing Eurasian ransomware groups sharing victim information with each other. So these actors were selling victim information to others. Uh, usually downstream because this information is rich in PII. Um, so it makes it very appealing to these criminals who want to make more money, which is the whole reason that they're doing this usually. Um, one stolen identity can be used for multiple things. So they're utilizing it over and over again. Um, the FBI uh, observed some of the ransomware threat actors in 2020 and 2021, um, and they were able to or, excuse me, disrupt some of those attacks and some ransomware payments. Um, so that helped redirect efforts away from the big businesses, but they just moved to new targets, the midsize and the globally diverse ones. So yeah, they're not targeting this group, but you know they were able to adapt and uh, put their efforts in other areas. 
Um, interestingly enough, though, after announcing its shutdown, the Black Matter ransomware group actually transferred all of its existing victims to Lockbit 2.0, which is another ransomware group. And that's not all that uncommon, unfortunately. So um, ransomware actors have also diversified, or, excuse me, diversified approaches to extortion. So they may try to double or triple their money from you. They'll disrupt your internet access. They'll threaten to publicly release stolen sensitive information. And unfortunately, it's not a threat. They have actually released private information about individuals that an organization holds. So um, they might tell your partners, your shareholders, or your suppliers that you have this breach. So they're not just trying to use reputation, or so they're trying to use reputation reputation to put pressure on an institution to pay. And unfortunately, it's working. Um, all right, next slide, please. All right, so some of the primary access tactics we're seeing, uh, definitely phishing, which should be no surprise to anyone. Um, the stealing of RDP credentials, brute force, and exploiting vulnerabilities. Um, these will continue to, continue to be popular access tactics. Um, we saw that increase a little bit in 2020 and 2021 because of the remote work that was taking place. Um, all of a sudden, employees went from being protected on a university network to somewhat defending themselves on their home networks. So the criminals knew this, and obviously they took advantage of it successfully, I might add. We also see some sophistication around these services. There's a market, and it's becoming professional. So ransomware as a service is a thing. It's white glove treatment. Um, they hire independent services to negotiate payments. So say for example, it's a multi-million dollar payment with a healthcare institution. That institution may not have the experience to deal with it. So they would hire a third party. Um, independent service may be a law firm to negotiate that payment. Um, these people have victim support lines. They wanna make sure that their victims are able to pay that ransom. So they have 24 by seven support desks, just like you would your help desk, um, you know, that the technology departments have. Um, they also arbitrate payment disputes with other ransomware holders. So it's really big business. Um, next slide. I often joke, and it's not a joke, but it's very true that certain businesses could take a lesson from these ransomware groups because their customer service is phenomenal. And it's, I like I say, it's jokingly, but it's very true. I mean, they will do whatever they can to make sure you pay that money. Um, so this next slide, um, it really highlights the analysis and resources that CISA and the federal government have expanded on or expended on ransomware recently. Um, this list is um, the alerts on ransomware that we've seen just since last August. So August of 2021. You can see a variety of, people, of groups here. You've got Conti, Black Matter, um, and new to the arena, arena as of this month is Karakurt. So all kinds of different options here. Um, and these are constantly being updated with new IOCs and TTPs. So um, yeah, so that's just, that's just some of them, recent. Next slide, please. All right. So. Let's talk a little bit about some of the trends, changing threats and uh, news that's, that you're seeing now. So here you'll see that the top 10 ransomware strains by venue, um, Conti is the largest by far in terms of the most money. It's one of the oldest and most lucrative of all the strains. Um, and in the spring of 2020, you may or may not know about this, but the Conti was responsible for the attack that led, or the attack against Ireland's public health services. Um, US federal officials estimate that 80% of Ireland's public health services were locked out by Conti in that attack, which is huge, uh, really big impact and really big money. Um, some of these bullets point out some additional you know, costs out there. In 2021, Crypto analysis group chain, out, chain analysis, excuse me, tracked $602, $602 million in ransomware payments um, made because of ransomware attacks or threats. They estimate that in the year before it was around 700 million overall. Um, so it's extremely high profit, which means a high success rate. Um, and it doesn't always necessarily go up 
every year it kind of ebbs and flows so um, as i stated before with one um, group going out of business you might see that uh, profit decrease um, we did see some terminations and some new businesses in 2021 um, the emergence of a new nation state attacker state actor um, iran is now throwing their hat in the ring um, and then in late 2021, we saw the use of reversible encryption, which just makes everything much easier. The whole transaction is easier than having to do a, do a true decryption. So we might see more of that play out in the coming years. One silver lining um, to all of this is last year, the Department of Justice in combination with the IRS was able to recover some big ransomware payments, including part of the colonial pipeline ransom that was paid. So there is a bit of a silver lining. Um, next slide, please. All right, a little bit more about what we've seen trending in 2021. The Conti ransomware gang, who I mentioned before, took over TrickBot malware operations. And TrickBot is a tool of absolute nastiness. It's awful. It steals banking info, account creds, PII, it has a variety of malware built into it. Um, it has been given capabilities to move laterally and gain a foothold in um, an affected network using exploits can propagate copies of itself via SMB shares, can even drop other malware like Ryuk ransomware. Um, it's just badness all around. The fact that Conti took that over means that they're likely going to use it. It also signals um, a change from this ad hoc affiliation of you know, buddies or cronies, um, excuse me, <clears throat> working together and basically shifting to more of a um, trusted team-based uh, business model. This is also a sign of sophistication that doesn't, didn't exist pr uh, previously. Next slide. All right, so with that, I am gonna turn things over to Kristen for a deeper dive on Black Cat Ransomware. Okay, <clears throat> so I chose Black Cat. Um, if any of you attended the AniSatCon, I, I did a kind of a, a bit of a deep dive on PISA, Protect Your Systems Amigo, only because um, it was a, a heavy hitter in 2020 and 2021, and I kind of got a kick out of the way they named it. Um, the uh, Black Hat ALF. So this one's really, <laughs> this one's really interesting. It has morphed so much even within two months. So in, like I said, in April of 2020, the FBI released a flash alert. And that's basically saying, hey, we're seeing a lot of activity on this. Here's your IOCs, kind of start looking at your systems. Um, here's some mitigation steps that you can start taking. Um, Black Hat, pretty much like almost every current ransomware in use today is they're, they're exfiltrating, they're encrypting, and then they name and shame. So it's a double extortion. Um, they're ransomware as a service, like Sarah mentioned. Um, and ransomware as a service is actually really interesting itself. So you have a number of different groups of people working together here. So you have access brokers, and these are the people that are actually going in and compromising the networks and establishing some level of persistence. Uh, you have operators, and these are the people that are developing these ransomware tools. Affiliates are kind of the ones that sign on and say, hey, we'll go in and actually execute the ransomware for our cut in whatever that the, the ransomware is. So they're the ones that are moving laterally within a network, exfiltrating data and actually executing that ransomware payload. Uh, it's the first to use Rust, which ironically is a more secure programming language. Um, it, it's faster, it can dodge conventional security solutions. And it's, um, from what I was reading, it's harder to reverse engineer, but I think that's more because it's so new and people haven't gotten their hands on and been able to really tear it apart. It's very configurable and it uses a JSON file. So you can say, what your extension can be. So think of that for a minute. So 
for example, the PISA ransomware, everything was encrypted, the files ended with that PISA. Now you can just name it whatever you want. So how are you gonna find that? How are you gonna look for that if they can just name it? They could change it every time they use it. Ransomware notes differ. So it can be very targeted ransom notes. It could be very generic ransom notes. And the encryption, you can change what encryption you're using. You can even, it even allows you to say what folders and files and extensions you, you don't want to encrypt. Um, and services and processes to terminate. So it can go in and say, terminate where um, McAfee might be running or terminate where Microsoft Defender might be running. So, you know, uh, these are just really evolving ransomware tools. Um, and it encrypts data on Windows, Linux, and VMware ESXi systems. So think about that as well. If it's encrypting your underlying VMware um, infrastructure, it, it's not gonna take much to get onto those guest machines. So the next two slides, what I wanna do is so, uh, show kind of the, how this is morphing. This slide talks about the information that came from the FBI flash alert. So at the time the flash alert came out and this Black Cat Elf has been around, they first saw it used in the wild in November of 2021. Uh, when the flash alert came out in April, they didn't have a solid um, handle on what the initial access was. They knew it was using previously compromised credentials they would go in and compromise Active Directory and grab more accounts, including admin accounts. Uh, the, some of the tools being used was Task Scheduler to use GPOs to deploy the ransomware, uh, group policy. PowerShell and Cobalt Strike were being used, Windows admin tools, system internals tools. Um, these are all tools that are um, out there for good and being used for evil, basically. Uh, it exfiltrates data, encrypts all the connected Windows, Linux, and cloud devices. So think about that too, because if you have things going into the cloud and you have networking to that and the, and the threat actors can get there, it can get to your cloud stuff too. And then, our, whoops, go back. And then, um, it drops a ransomware note as a file in the system. So moving forward to this month, Microsoft Defender Threat Intelligence Team put out a, a blog post on what they called the many lives of black cat ransomware. And they're not kidding when they talk about this because literally threat actors are taking this tool or this ransomware and they're fitting it in to their already established tactics, techniques, and procedures. So it makes it very, one, it's gonna make it very difficult for attribution to, to, to figure out who is in your system. Um, and then, like I said, that, that ability to configure what it's doing is also gonna make it very difficult to threat hunt for it. Uh, unless you're constantly on top of all the IOCs that are coming out. So just to show you, um, the, the Defender article was talking about, you know, depending on what affiliate is using this tool, initial access, they're now saying, they're now seeing it as coming from remote desktop applications and compromised credentials. And in one case, they said they saw exploitation of an exchange, exchange server vulnerabilities. It uses things that you would normally find on a computer. So uh, WMIC, command, net, PSExec, uh, MSTSC, so remote, remote desktoping. It uses some other tools you can, depending on, again, on the affiliate, for going out and basically reconning what's on the network and what's in your Active Directory. So AD recon, PowerShell command, let's Mimi cats to pull those credentials. In one situation they were talking about actually going into task manager, 
and dumping the lsas.exe process and that gave them all the um all the credentials so as i was reading this the blog post i was kind of just sitting there thinking these these blog posts need to be read with a beer or something else calming because it was just it was making my heart race because of how, how crazy this is. And then data theft tools. So exfiltrating that those massive amounts of data is mega sync is what's been seen in our clone. And with that, I'm gonna turn it back to Sarah to talk about how this is impacting higher ed institutions. Thanks, Kristen. You know, they actually have a thing called Beer with Talos where they talk about vulnerability yeah, and fear. So apparently it's I not thought that was that. well named, well named <laughs> podcast. Exactly. Awesome. So you can go to the next slide. Um, so we see research and education both as a microcosm and a, a microcosm and a target. So we're essentially seeing the same thing as every other organization on the internet. Um, where it's all just one big pot and we're a small piece of it, right? So sometimes we see opportunistic attacks, then other times we see research and education as a target. Um, the research in higher ed institutions is extremely coveted. We all know this, right? Higher ed also has a lot of very rich PII um, on an, a variety of individuals, which is also very lucrative to have. So these two items make us a target in some areas, in some instances, for sure, right? Um, but on the other side of the corn, we corn we often coin we often see what everyone else sees, um, and the rest of these bullets um, sort of fit that model. So the first one is disrupted services, um, and I saw a few people talking in chat about Lincoln. Um, was at Lincoln University, um, which was a university that got hit by a ransomware attack. I was actually reading about that as I was putting my slides together um, about how that's what finally did the Porter University in. I, obviously, there were some other issues, but um, the one example here was January 20 or 2022. Um, there was a ransomware attack on a U.S. county. I left the name out. Um, and they were forced to take computer systems offline, close public offices, um, obliged, to, bl obliged it to run emergency uh, response operations on backup contingencies. The, the attack also deactivated automatic doors, resulting in safety concerns. So this shows the bleed over to the Internet of Things and physical security devices really comes into play with disrupted services. So it's really scary. Uh, maybe not something that you necessarily think of when you hear about a hacked account, but um, definitely something to, you know, to be aware of. Um, I've also got data loss and exposure. Um, they're going to go through the institution's data and look for anything that they can sell or that they can use in other ways. So um, you might lose that data or it may be exposed. For example, student financial aid is not something that you want to expose. Um, so you could lose control of it to a certain extent if the ransomware criminals get a hold of it, right? Um, it's costly, and we all know this. I mean, that's one thing that definitely is at the top of the list. Most people need to engage third-party services. Some may not know how to pay Bitcoin and other uh, cyber currency. Um, so how do you go about doing that, right? How do you detect it? It's hard to detect this kind of stuff. So. Um, you need to know about this stuff before you can mitigate it, right? So it's all really costly. It all adds up. It's not just that initial ransom that you have to pay. There's all these other factors involved that add up, right? Um, another thing is very time consuming, resource heavy and anxiety building. Like Kristen mentioned, you need to be able to read some of these blogs because it is stressful. You've got people working with some urgency because there's this active ransom demand and there's no other choice you have to work on it you have to figure it out right um it's very disruptive so a ransomware attack again is more than just amount of ransom it's much more than that um cyber insurance i'm really not going to focus too much on this just say that that we're seeing a lot of changes to the cyber lance or cyber insurance landscape 
um, which is largely driven by the surge in ransomware. Kristen's going to touch a bit on this later uh, while she's talking about the mitigations. So um, I've mentioned service outages or disrupted services. Another piece of that is reputation, right? So every time someone is unable to access your website or your application, your reputation could possibly uh, be eroding just a bit, right? So next slide. So this was, I just added this in this morning. I was just curious. So I took a look at Microsoft's real-time threat map. Um, and in the last 30 days, you can see higher ed has reported over 6 million malware encounters. But this is crazy, right? So it's easy to see just by looking at this, how much more targeted higher ed is than other sectors below, which I, I wasn't expecting the numbers to be that different, but um, it was kind of mind boggling. All right, next slide, please. Great, so mitigations. Now that I've successfully dampened the mood with all of the badness, um, let's look to Kristen to see what we can do to protect ourselves from this horrible growing threat. Kristen? Okay, so any chance I get to be in front of a captive audience, um, I am, and we're talking about mitigations, I am always going to push know your assets. Um, you can't protect what you can't see or you don't know about. So you have a faculty member that's running a server under his desk that's open to the world and has um, his research on it that could be patented or, you know, it could, he, I mean, it's, it's gone. It's not being backed up. You don't know about it. You can't help that faculty member protect that information. So I am a huge proponent of knowing your assets. And sometimes I know that there's the, the thought that, oh, but that takes these, you have to purchase an asset management system and it's too expensive and we don't, and we don't have the resources, but how much resources are you going to be putting into fixing things after a ransomware attack? And if you're already running Microsoft 365 in your organization, you can use a spreadsheet <laughs> or it's, I mean, asset tracking can be as simple as using a spreadsheet. So there are thousands of blog posts and articles on ransomware and you'll get dozens of mitigation things within each of those articles. And so how do you determine which ones to act, to act on? So I boiled this down to, this is what the, the FBI is saying, this is what CISA is saying, and this is what some of the top cybersecurity um, organizations are saying. So moving on from knowing your assets, I, actually, let me back step a bit. Within knowing your assets, you also have to know what is for, if you have a server as an asset, what's on that server? Is it HIPAA? Is it FERPA? Is it CUI? Is it DOD? And you have to understand how you're supposed to be protecting each of those regulated bits of data. So where to go from there, multi-factor authentication, I think that's that's been a drum being beaten for years now, but um, it works, except now we're seeing incidents of um, kind of using Duo or other MFA token type things to kind of break in through that way where they're sending multiple pings uh, multiple numbers on, on Duo and people are just responding to them, not thinking that, oh, wait a second, I didn't request a, a key. So why is it giving me one? Um, regular vulnerability scanning, installing updates and pass patches as soon as possible. And initially I had written here, which is really surprising from because I come from an operational background, so I know this isn't possible, but... I originally had typed in here, install updates and patches as soon as they're released. And then I kind of thought about that. I'm like, yeah, that's just not reasonable. You want to install them as soon as possible, um, knowing that you, depending on how widespread that patch is going to, and what that patch is going to impact, um, you want to be able to evaluate that and at least get it into your change management process and get it moving as soon as it's released. And then security awareness training. Um, 
This is another one that is really important. I think it's really important, but it's also really tricky, right? Because you're asking people to change their inherent behavior. And if they inherently trust everything, they're not gonna hesitate to click on a link that a friend might have sent, that a friend might have sent them. So it's an interesting, um, it's necessary, but uh, I don't think people realize sometimes how intricate that can get. Um, and then here's a whole host of kind of other things that has been suggested. So obviously antivirus, adding an alert banner um, to your emails that come in from external sources, backups, air gap them, password protect them, have multiple copies, test your backups, um, segment your network. If you know, for example, I know um, in higher education, we often run into situations where a department or a faculty member is running an instrument that is running on like Windows NT and can't upgrade it, doesn't want a new instrument because he likes the one that he has. So you can still accommodate that by just segmenting them into their own network so nothing gets in and out. Um, keeping multiple copies of critical data. A lot of this we've heard over and over again, don't reuse passwords. Disable unused remote access ports and monitor logs. So this is really important when it comes to remote work, right? Monitoring the logs. Sometimes we can't disable the remote access ports because based on who's connecting to the network, but we can monitor the logs and look for odd, odd connections coming in. SMB version one and SMB version two those are readily used to push malware across the network. So if you can disable them, please do it. Avoiding public Wi-Fi using a VPN. Least privilege, regularly audit elevated accounts. Um, segment your account, your admin accounts into, so that you know that if you have um, a normal level account that's attempting to do admin level work, you set a flag on that to investigate it and even vice versa. If you have an admin level account trying to do stuff locally on a machine, that might be something also something you wanna check in. Know the baseline behavior that happens within your network and within your accounts. So that, that hits with baselining network material uh, behavior. Incident response plans. Um, this is not something that you wanna be writing as you're in the middle of an incident. You wanna have this in place, you wanna test it with tabletop exercises. You wanna do it specific to ransomware and have a playbook for ransomware. So if you're not familiar with playbooks, within an incident response plan, this is kind of like, we have declared an incident, now what do we do? And this document would guide you through who needs to be involved, how often, who, who's talking to who, who is your media people? Are you talking to your media people? Are your media people actually talking to legal and all that information, who gets involved? Your playbook is specific to the type of event. So if you get hit by ransomware, you're gonna pull out your ransomware playbook and kind of run through those steps. Okay, and then some final guidance about mitigation. Join an ISAC if you're not. So run ISAC is, like Sarah said, we represent higher education and research networks. We push out and collect information and intel from the government, from other third-party uh, providers of intel, and we push that out to our members um, along with our CSERT work. And actually the CSERT work, we do send that out to both members and non-members. So those notifications that go out. CISA has the ransomware readiness assessment. Um, this is a great place to start and it's free. All you gotta do is go download it. And then CISA's cyber hygiene services, also free. So this is another thing to take a look at. If you don't have um, on-campus capabilities to, or resources to do vulnerability scanning or web application scanning. Uh, they have phishing campaign assessment and they also do remote pen testing. And then finally, like Sarah mentioned, I just, I'm not gonna go into in depth on cyber insurance. Um, we spent 
almost four to five hours at Educause CBPC at a workshop on this, so I can go on about it for quite a while. Um, but I just want to note a couple things. If you have cyber insurance, make sure it covers ransomware. A lot of policies are changing and they're making it a separate rider. Um, if your policy does cover ransomware or if you have a rider, make sure you understand what losses it covers because it's not necessarily going to cover all of them. So those are two things that I just, I wanna make sure that people are, uh, are in the know on. And then if you have any other questions, that's my email address, that's Sarah's email address. And I think we're, um, Jeanette, we're good if there are some questions. Just one a couple quick things I'd like to mention as well. Kristen mentioned, mentioned like the workshops or the the um, uh, the exercises that you can do, the tabletops. Um, every year, Ren Isaac does a blended threat workshop. And this past year, it was ransomware with the phishing component, and it was a really really great experience. Um, we did it was the first time we've ever done our virtual uh, workshops, so we had a we had a really good turnout. And there was some really good insight that was shared. And um, I have in the the stuff that um, Janine or uh, Jeanette linked to um, at the beginning, there's a government and ransomware, our government and Ren ISAC ransomware resources page. And there's a lot of stuff in there. Um, it's really helpful. And on the second page, there is a link for the um, the workshop findings, the final report and the briefs and things like that. We have all of the information listed. So if you choose to, you can actually host your own workshop because all of the scenario and everything is already in there. And you can also read some of the feedback that we got from other institutions that would be helpful. One thing to know is when you're creating your incident response, make sure you know who your key stakeholders are and get them involved immediately. You need to know if you're uh, general counsel, the, the president of the university, whatever, you need to get that information together beforehand, it's imperative because you, like Kristen said, you do not want to have to worry about this if you get hit with the ransomware. You need to have it already uh, already set in motion. So thank you. All right, questions? Actually, okay, um, let me, oh, go ahead. Hey, Jeanette, let me add one thing. So Brian Kelly sent a link um, where yet another higher education organization got hit yesterday. So oh. I have to change my slides again. Napa. I shouldn't laugh, but because that's yeah, that's sad. But uh, yeah, so that just goes to show you how rapidly this is this changes. Yes, and I was reading about this terrible story with the Lincoln College. So so tragic that the university was going through so many financial struggles already because of COVID and everything else, and then this is the thing that that closed it down. So yes, the stakes here are very high. Um, we want to protect these universities. So um, while people are thinking about any questions for the, the um, guests, I've got a couple of community updates. Uh, first, our Trusted CI Cybersecurity Summit um, is October 18th through the 20th in Bloomington, Indiana. So uh, just if you're on our mailing list, you probably are aware, but just please keep your eyes posted for more information about registration. Um, I think we're wrapping up CFPs uh, for now, but uh, if there's any announcements or extensions, we'll be communicating that um, through our announcements email alias. And our next webinar for Trusted CI is going to be August 22nd, again at 11 a.m. Eastern, and our topic is CIS controls with Trusted CI. So uh, we hope that those of you who are attending, if you want to learn more about how to protect your assets, this is another thing that you could be doing to educate yourself. And then we've got a question here um, from Juan. Uh, ransomware gangs using LOL bins, I guess is how you pronounce that, make detection extremely difficult regarding the use of skick tax? <laughs> Schedule tasks. Okay. <laughs> Any good resources for quick wins when looking for IOCs in scheduled tasks other than looking for hidden scheduled tasks? You know, that's um, that's really a great question and a good point that when an LOL is, is living off the land um, executables. So like I said, they're using things that are readily available on your systems to, and, uh, to, to, to execute some of the stuff. Scheduled tasks, from my experience, the best thing to do is just know what's not supposed to be there. So 
um, if you've ever gone into like schedule tasks on your laptop, there, there's a list of ones that are there because they're, they are created by the system. And there might be some there that are, are created by um, the user, most likely not though, unless they're in IT and they know how to use schedule tasks and they have a specific, a specific need. But um, like the best thing is to just know what's not supposed to be there. I haven't seen any specific like IOCs for scheduled tasks. And I think given how configurable some of these ransomware tools are, that's gonna be that's gonna be tricky to to uh, to track. Um, kind of similarly, I saw some interesting things uh, for business email compromise where they uh, the uh, the adversary or the, was creating uh, outlook rules in a person's account that basically said if anything came in from um, this specific person, which happened to be somebody from our security group, it was just to go straight to trash. So while they were while they were kind of trying to um, troubleshoot and figure out what was going on and what had happened with this, they were blocking uh, email communication with our security group. Um, Again, that came down to, and we actually, I think we were actually able to set up a, a sim alert that said, hey, we've got a new kind of wonky looking outlook rule. And it would alert when, whenever we saw that kind of wonky outlook rule set up. So um, I, there's probably ways, but really I think it comes down to how are you, you need a baseline of what looks, what looks right for your network. That's very interesting. <laughs> How can you inform them of a problem if you can't reach them because yeah, they're intercepting really the message? Aggravating. <laughs> okay, so here's a, here's an interesting challenge. Um, I've got colleagues who never take the training for security related topics seriously. Any hints <laughs> on how to help them in the 2020s? And this person is referring to colleagues in their team and they work in software development. That's a tough one because if they're developing a product, they have to bake that security in from the get go. So. Uh -huh. I I, I don't, I'm, I'm really, you know, first, Kristen. I think as a colleague, um, you're going to have trouble. It has, I think it's going to have to come top down. Your management is going to have to be the one that says, look, y'all should be looking at the OWASP top 10 every time you're, you're developing something or, um, you know, there has to be a policy set. Um, emphasis put on, you know, with starting with building and security from the start. Um, trying to go in and add security after the fact is so painful. Um, and that's why a lot of groups just don't want to do it. If they, you know, and, and a lot of times they're, they're, they're crunching time up front because they're crunched for time. So what's the first thing they're going to drop that probably takes a lot of time? It's the security part. So I, for me, I think a lot of that has to come from, you know, uh, your management or emphasizing with your management, hey, we, we could actually save a lot of time on the back end and save resources if we thought about this up front. Yeah, and this isn't a situation where you want them to have to experience why it's an issue. You know, you want them to <laughs> trying to prevent that. Um, yeah, I agree. Top from top down. I don't know how otherwise you could. You wouldn't want to be hacked and have them run that way. So hope that helps. <laughs> okay, um, let me go over one more um, slide while we're letting people type questions. Um, so thank you for those of you who attended this webinar. Um, we uh, we do this on a, at a monthly basis. Uh, 
And so uh, we communicate these announcements through our announce announcements uh, email alias. But if you want to go back and look at other other presentations, you can visit us at trustedci.org slash webinars. If you've got questions for me or if you want, if there's a topic that you would like me to, 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 to try to hunt down a presenter for, you can email at webinars at trustedci.org. Um, <laughs> so we've got some uh some uh, compliments in the chat here. And then we've got any good resources or templates on crafting incident response playbooks or tabletop exercises. I think that's probably yep. answer or answered in the resources. Thank you, correct? Yep. Brian, thank you. Um, yeah, so there's a bunch of good resources. The one that I included um, that uh, is linked here in the chat, Brian also just uh, provided a link for you. Um, there are a ton of good resources in there. The federal government really has stepped up to the plate and they are trying really hard to help circumvent some of this badness. So take advantage of those resources. Absolutely. That's what they're there for. Um, so yeah. And if you have any questions, please feel free to email us. You know, we're always there to help, even if you're not a member, you know, just, just reach out. One thing for tabletop exercises that I thought I mentioned because I just recently bought this, um, to use with my team, it's, um, I think it's by Black Hills. Back doors and breaches. Yeah, back doors and breaches, yeah. which yeah. is a really good way. It's a gamified way of, of looking at all your all these incident response type scenarios. Um, if I can find the link real quick, Jeanette, I can send it to you if you can add it. I think it. they have a GitHub repository where you can get it for free, don't they? Um, you have to print it probably. out. I also just pasted into the chat a, um, it's the Department of Homeland Security Office of Academic Engagement, and they're the ones that did the national tabletops. They now have a um, exercise starter kit, and you can pick from different scenarios, and you can customize them for your own group. So um, they took a little hiatus the last two years, but you can you can do your own that way as well. And they have some other good resources that are yeah. focused on higher ed. These are great. Um, I did I did find back top back doors and breaches, and um, I'll include the that and the other links that we posted in our follow up email to the people who want to see the video. Good deal. Oh, okay, great. great. Well, I think I think we've covered all of our questions, but uh, definitely um, reach out to me or reach out to Ren Isaac if you need if more assistance. And with that, I think I'll wrap things up. So, any final comments, um, Sarah and Kristen? I don't know. No, I <laughs> just like I'm looking at the comments or in the chat about afraid to do your job. Um, I think that's <laughs> I think that's why a lot of it, why a lot, why a lot of us, you know, why do we get into cybersecurity or infosec because or IT? Um, we start to question that, but as I think, as long as we're doing everything we can personally to you know, protect our own space and keep, be aware of what's going on around us. Um, we shouldn't be too scared about <laughs> doing our jobs. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you for having us and thank you for everyone. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thanks, yeah. Janet. Thank you. Um, well, with that, I'm going to end the meeting and we'll, we'll call it a day, but everyone else have a great day and uh, see you next time. Thank you. Bye.